Hello guys, let's talk about intermolecular forces. In molecules, we can distinguish between two types of forces, intramolecular, which are within the molecule. For example, if I have hydrochloric acid, HCl, this polar covalent bond is going to be an intramolecular force between the two atoms. Now, I know that this bond is actually polar because chlorine has a significantly higher electronegativity compared to hydrogen. So it pulls away the electron from the hydrogen atom. This is going to produce a partial positive charge on the hydrogen side and the partial negative charge on the chlorine atom side. Now, what are intermolecular forces? Those are forces between molecules. So if I draw another HCl molecule next to my first one, and I also know that the hydrogen side is going to be partial positive, and the chlorine side is going to be partially negative, there is going to be an electrostatic attraction between the chlorine atom of one of the molecules and the hydrogen atom of the other molecule. So this force right here between the two molecules is called intermolecular attraction or intermolecular force. Now, very, very important to understand that the attractions between molecules are not nearly as strong as the intramolecular attractions or bonds that hold the compounds together. And the fundamental difference between states of matter is the strengths of the intermolecular forces of attraction. So if you have really, really strong forces between molecules, they're going to be closer to each other. When you have weaker forces, they are going to be further away from each other. And many physical properties reflect the strengths of these intermolecular forces, for example, the boiling point of a compound. And this makes sense because if you think about what happens when a liquid is boiling, in a liquid we are going to have the molecules closer to each other. And in a gas we are going to have them separated and then just zooming around, right? So the boiling point will reflect how hard it is to separate the molecules from each other in a liquid compared to the gas. So if there is a lot of attraction between the liquid molecules, it's going to be harder to get to the gas phase, whereas where there is small attraction, it's going to be easier to evaporate from a liquid into a gaseous phase. Okay, now the question is, how do we figure out how strong are these intermolecular forces? Well, we have to look at the three types of intermolecular forces between neutral molecules. And I'm going to start with the weakest and go to the strongest types. So the weakest type is the so-called London dispersion forces or LDF. These are also called instantaneous dipole induced dipole interactions. Okay, so all molecules actually have these type of force. They can be quite significant for heavy molecules. However, they are quite weak in general. Now, stronger forces are the so-called dipole-dipole forces, which exist between polar molecules. And a special case of dipole-dipole interactions is called hydrogen bonding. And it's really awesome and fascinating. You are going to see it in a few minutes. But first, let's talk about London dispersion forces, or LDF. So these forces are named after the German scientist Fritz London. And these forces are generated between nonpolar particles that can temporarily be polarized to create a so called dispersion force. So let's say that I have two helium atoms next to each other. So this is my first atom, and this is my second atom. The nuclei are somewhere here, and I'm going to have two electrons. Right, so let's say one electron here. I'm going to just represent it with an X and another electron here. So this is atom A. In atom B, I'm going to have the two electrons here and here. So these are all my electrons. 
And as time goes by, the electrons are moving around, right? So I have, again, my atom A and my atom B. And let's say that at some point, both of the electrons in my atom B are end up on one side of the atom, and the electrons in A are just still, you know, all over the place. But at this point, I'm going to have a partial negative charge created on one side of my atom B and a partial positive charge created on the other side of my atom B. Okay, so what happens to atom A at this point? Atom A is like, hey, there is some kind of charge just appeared around me. What if I get polarized and also arrange my electrons in a way to create an electrostatic attraction? So after this, in atom A, the electrons are like, oh, I can feel a nucleus. So they are going to move to one side of the atom, creating a partial negative charge there, whereas on the other side, we are going to have a partial positive charge. And in atom B, I'm still going to have the two electrons on this side too, while having a partial negative charge there and a partial positive charge here. So basically, there is going to be a weak electrostatic attraction between the nucleus of one of my atoms and the electron of my other atom, okay? So these forces are quite weak. They're short-lived, right? Electrons are zooming around really, really quickly, but they can be very significant for large atoms. All right, let's talk about dipole-dipole interactions. When you have a polar molecule which have a more positive and a more negative end, you are going to see so-called dipoles. So just as at the beginning of this video I discussed in case of hydrochloric acid, we are going to have a partial negative charge on the chlorine atoms, a partial positive charge on the hydrogen atoms, and if we have two molecules, the negatively charged chlorine atom is going to be attracted to the positively charged hydrogen atom of another molecule. So the bond between the hydrogen and the chlorine atom within one molecule is going to be polar covalent. And the bond between a chlorine atom of one of the molecules and the hydrogen atom of the other molecule is going to be an intermolecular attraction, more specifically a dipole-dipole interaction. Okay, I hope this makes sense. So there are actually even stronger dipole-dipole interactions which are called hydrogen bonding. So this is a special type of interaction, in which case the molecule contains a hydrogen atom which is bonded to either a nitrogen or an oxygen or a fluorine atom. And the easiest way to remember this is just to remember, hey, hydrogen just wants to have fun or fun, right? Because fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, F-O-N. Don't mix it up with you because that's uranium and then there is definitely no hydrogen bonding involving uranium in this case, okay? So what are the examples? Well, the simplest example is hydrofluoric acid. When I have a hydrogen atom bonded to a fluorine atom, we are going to have a partial positive charge on the hydrogen side and a partial negative charge on the fluorine side. Now, if you remember, fluorine actually has the highest electronegativity between all the elements. So because of that, fluorine is like, hey, hydrogen, give me all your electrons. So the hydrogen side is basically going to be a bare nucleus because hydrogen only has one electron and fluorine is taking it away. Okay, and there will be a so-called hydrogen bonding between the hydrogen atom of an other hydrofluoric acid molecule. Okay, so this is still the same as the dipole-dipole interaction that we discussed at the beginning. The difference is that here we have a fluorine atom involved. The same happens in case of water and ammonia. 
let me show you. So when I have a water molecule, we know that the geometry is bent and the hydrogen sides are going to be partially positively charged and the oxygen side is going to be partially negatively charged because oxygen's electronegativity is significantly higher than hydrogen's, so it's taking away the electrons from the two hydrogen atoms. And then when it meets with another water molecule, there will be a hydrogen bonding between that oxygen atom and the hydrogen atom of the other water molecule. So we are still going to have the partial positive and the partial negative charges. Same thing happens in case of ammonia, which is NH3. Right, so I'm going to draw it right here. So nitrogen has a significantly higher electronegativity than hydrogen. So we are going to have a partial negative charge on the nitrogen atom and partial positive charges on the hydrogen atoms. And when it meets with another ammonia molecule, there will be hydrogen bonding between the nitrogen atom and the hydrogen atom of the other ammonia molecule. Okay, so still partial positive charges and partial negative charge. Okay, I hope this makes sense. Actually, hydrogen bonding is really, really awesome. Why? Because it actually gives the double helical structure of the DNA. So large molecules are called macromolecules, such as DNA. And it's possible to have bonding between parts of the same macromolecule, which is going to induce folding in specific ways into a specific shape. So the double helix of the DNA molecule is actually mainly caused by hydrogen bonding between the so-called base pairs. So there are four bases in a DNA molecule, guanine, cytosine, adenine, and timine. And guanine is always going to form a base pair with cytosine with hydrogen bonds added. And if we look at the DNA, so these are basically the flat parts right here in the DNA structure. Okay, so when you actually separate the two strands of DNA, if you have a cytosine on one side, you know that if you add another strand to it, you need to have a guanine there, right? Because they actually give you a match. And the same thing happens between adenine and timine with these hydrogen bonds. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this topic. And I hope it makes sense. See you in the next video.